I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Thank you, Judge Burkett. That was really insightful. And just something that came to mind during those remarks, uh, you know, to kind of take the onus off of the, uh, the prosecutors here and, and put a little bit back on the legislators. Uh, a little anecdote, I was, I was on the train heading back from Washington, D.C., and I happened to be sitting across from a, a member of Congress who will remain nameless. And um, we were talking about everything that we disagree on, which was everything. And then we finally found something we could agree on, over-criminalization. And we started talking about how this is a problem and it really has to be, you know, taken seriously and uh, it really is something real that, that Congress can take action on. And then his phone rings and he picks it up and he's talking about this headline he saw in the New York Times and this is just atrocious and the next words out of his mouth were, we should make this a crime. So we just spoke about this two minutes ago. You were telling me how overcriminalization is a problem, and your knee-jerk reaction as a legislator was, there's a headline, there's a problem. I can get ahead of it by making it a crime and, and have my name in the headlines for, for addressing this egregious issue. And so it, a lot of the responsibility does fall on legislators as well as you know, prosecutors who are uh, exercising discretion given to them by broad and vague statutes that come from you know, these, these uh, reactions that uh, occur on an Amtrak coming from D.C. Uh, that's how our criminal laws are written. Um, so I'd like to quickly uh, move to our panel discussion, which is, uh, I think, just uh, full of great experts, and, and we're going we're gonna to really get some insights on this problem on a and state level. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, who will then introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, Paul Larkin. Uh, he directs the Heritage Foundation's project to counter abuse of the criminal law, particularly at the federal level. As a senior legal research fellow in the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, this overcriminalization project is part of the Heritage's Rule of Law Initiative. Uh, Paul received his law degree from Stanford Law School and was a published member of the Stanford Law Review. He clerked for Judge Robert H. Bork of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In 2010, he received a master's degree in public policy from George Washington University. He also holds a B.A. in philosophy from Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, where he graduated summa cum laude with honors. And before joining Heritage in September 2011, uh, Paul held various positions with the federal government in Washington, D.C., at the U.S. DOJ from 1984 to 1993, Paul served as the, an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division section on organized crime and racketeering. He argued 27 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1996-1997, Paul served as counsel to Senate Judiciary Committee uh, and head of the crime unit for Senator Orrin Hatch, then the panel's chairman. He worked in the, EPA's, uh, in the EPA from 1998 to 2004 as a special agent for criminal enforcement, also serving as acting director in 2004. And uh, with an array of honors, you can look at his full bio. So Paul, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac, thank you for the kind words, and thank you for the opportunity to come and moderate the panel discussion on the subject of overcriminalization, particularly as it affects Illinois. Let me say in my own background, for me to deal with this issue is a little bit like Nixon going to China. I grew up in New York City in a family that was involved in law enforcement, particularly on the NYPD. Spent most of my professional career in one form or another involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, as Isaac said, I've, I've been a federal agent, I've worked at the Justice Department, and I worked on Capitol Hill. Uh, 
has given me the opportunity to see the criminal justice system from a lot of different perspectives, but normally also would be thought of as being the sort of person who wouldn't be concerned about the overuse of the criminal law, might more properly be thought of as somebody who is concerned with the uh, underuse of it. But the truth is overcriminalization is becoming a serious problem. What overcriminalization is can take many different forms, but let me say it generally speaking refers to the overuse or misuse of the criminal law rather than other types of tools to regulate social and economic conduct. It can take several different forms. You can have too many laws governing the same conduct. In the federal system, for example, there are dozens of laws dealing with false statements. There are dozens of laws dealing with fraud. You can't have a regulatory program these days that doesn't have its own false statement statute or its own fraud statute, even though the basic federal fraud statutes dealing with the use of the mails and the use of telecommunications facilities are more than adequate to take care of any possible type of chicanery that could be involved. Nonetheless, you see new statutes all the time. Why? Basically, overcriminalization is a result of a defect in the legislative process. Every time a legislative body looks at a matter, they always consider whether something should be made a crime. Why? It gives them a skin in the game. Generally speaking, the Judiciary Committee in the House and the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, the ones principally be responsible for criminal legislation at the federal level, but if you have another committee, whether it's the Homeland Security Committee or the Finance Committee, and you want to be able to engage the interest of the Attorney General or the FBI Director, the way you do that is by making something a crime. You can then demand that he spend uh, or she spend a certain amount of time, agents, lawyers, and the like, working on a matter that is of interest to your committee. It gives you the opportunity to play some role, not just in regulating the financial community, not just in regulating the health care community, not just in regulating any other aspect of the non-criminal work of the federal government, but also, in fact, it gives you the opportunity to command the attention and the resources of the people who normally are involved in investigating, prosecuting, or otherwise fighting crime. So what you see is, unfortunately, the overuse of the legislative process to deal with this sort of matter. Now, who are the victims when this often happens? By and large, if you take a look at it, the victims are average people, including small businessmen. And you will hear more about that from our panel members. The principal people who are at risk are people who don't know what the law is, and that basically takes in 99% of the people in the country. How do we learn what the law is? You don't normally learn it by going to law school. You learn it from all the other institutions that you come across throughout the rest of your life. You learn it from parents, from colleagues, from church, from school, from every non-governmental institution there is. Yes, there are people that go to law school, but there are very, very few of them in this country, and they themselves don't even know all of the laws. No lawyer, no law professor, no judge is probably as conversant with the criminal code in a particular jurisdiction as the professionals in that area, the public defenders, the prosecutors, and the police. But the average person in the United States should not be required to consult a public defender, a prosecutor, or a police officer to find out what is permissible and what isn't. Unfortunately, we are starting to reach that point. The criminal law in the American, American system is always operated on the assumption that everyone knows what the rules are because the rules, by and large, reflect contemporary mores. We have now have had the criminal law system since the Norman Conquest. We now have covered every basic problem that you could have of interpersonal violence, interpersonal economic relations, and the like. What we're doing with a lot of the new laws that come out are regulating conduct that normally is at the periphery of a lot of different concerns and is made a crime only because the legislature has said something should be a crime. You'll hear about that from some of the, the people on the panel. But I think what you are starting to realize is there may, in fact, be too many criminal laws out there, too many for the average person to know and certainly too many for the criminal justice system to hold people accountable for at risk of imprisonment. That's the subject of 
the over-criminalization concern. That is what people who are involved in this are concerned about. And that is what you're going to hear from three experts we have here. Our experts come at this problem with a wealth of experience in a variety of different fields. Legislative, executive, uh, private. We have people who have been public defenders or defense attorneys or prosecutors. And in fact, they've done different things in their careers. We have people who have worked in the legislature and worked in district attorney's offices. We have people who have dealt with broad issues and people who have small clients that they have to deal with by advising them how to stay within the confines of laws that are not within the ken of the average person. They have both intellectual heft and practical experience in this field. And what they say is definitely worth listening to because they deal with this problem, as they say, you know, on the ground. Let me give you a little bit of summary about each of our speakers. We first will hear from Stephen Baker. Stephen is the legislative liaison for the office of the Cook County Public Defender, a 1978 graduate of the Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago Law School. Stephen has been an assistant state's attorney and an assistant and chief public defender. And so he is a person who's been on both sides of the aisle or both sides of the courtroom, as Judge Burkett said. Stephen has been a liaison to the Illinois legislature for the Illinois Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys and the Cook County Public Defender's Office. He also has been president of the Illinois Public Defender Association and currently is a member of that board. After Stephen, we will hear from Erica Flager. Erica is the Assistant Director of the Institute for Justice Clinic on Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago Law School. A 1980 graduate of Yale Law School and a former law clerk for Associate Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, Erica worked in private practice at Sidley and Austin, specializing in corporate governance, business transactions, securities regulation, and the like. She also advised Chicago area nonprofit organizations on governance and organization. At the law school, Erica supervises two L's and three L's who help Chicago area lower income entrepreneurs navigate the legal challenges involved in starting and operating small businesses, such as setting up an organization, obtaining licenses, and not running afoul of the many different state and local ordinances that regulate what they do. Our third speaker will be Chris Hagee. And if I uh, didn't get that right, I apologize. It's not a crime. <laughs> at, at least not yet. <clears throat> but the night is young. Chris has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a law degree from the Chicago-Kent College of Law in Chicago. He served as a prosecutor in the DuPage County State Attorney's Office, where he successfully prosecuted thousands of criminal and civil matters, everything involving traffic, misdemeanor, and felony cases, as well as civil types of problems. Chris now works at Katherine Harris and Associates. And as far as I'm concerned, what's most important, he is an avid outdoorsman who has led expeditions and taught sailing, snorkeling, and deep sea fishing. So if you don't like what he has to say about uh, over-criminalization, at least talk with him about fishing. Gang, I want to introduce, as I say, the speakers and let them tell you about the real-life practical problems that this issue, which may seem otherwise abstract, can cause for average people. With that, we'll first hear from Stephen Baker. Thank you. Uh, three topics I want to talk about briefly. It fleshes out a little bit of what uh, Justice Burkett uh, was talking about, and I'll explain a little bit about the Clear Commission, uh, the SPAC sentencing group, and the problems that uh, they were created to address. As an initial matter, uh, when I looked at the federal materials uh, concerning over-criminalization, one of the major problems uh, that I read about in the federal system is the essentially elimination of mental states for criminal offenses. We're all familiar with the mental states. Intentional, knowing, reckless, negligent, strict liability. I may be guilty of a petty offense speeding, 
where I didn't know it, I didn't intend to speed, but it happens and I'm guilty. Apparently in the federal system, in some of the regulatory schemes, they have eliminated or created a statute that didn't include a mental state. Illinois does not really suffer from that problem. It's got other problems that I'll talk about momentarily, but as a general rule, it does not suffer from the problem of strict liability for uh, felony offenses. The clear commission that uh, Justice Burkett mentioned uh, was an initiative of a think tank in Chicago called Metropolis 2020, which uh, they renamed themselves recently to, I think it's called Metropolis Solutions. And they came around to the various stakeholders, state's attorneys, uh, public defenders, uh, defense bar groups. Uh, they spoke with political elected officials, chairman of the respective House and Senate Judiciary Committee to explain what their goal was in terms of an effort to simplify the criminal code. Uh, I'm kind of a cynic on these issues. The criminal code was reduced from 2000 to 1,689 pages. I mean, that's sort of the way I view the world. It standardized some of the mental states where we used to have willfully, which meant the same thing as knowingly, and they've standardized the mental states. There were not a lot of substantive changes. Uh, one of the substantive changes on uh, state penalties was to raise the felony level for retail theft and theft, uh, which hadn't been changed in almost 30 years. And the members of the Clear Commission, uh, which included elected officials, so they had skin in the game, uh, prosecutors, victim advocates, law enforcement, nothing moved without consensus. That's why you saw so very few uh, substantive changes in the criminal code. It drove practitioners nuts at least in the short term, because where they used to be able to find a statute, it got moved. You know, sex offenses go from Article 12 to Article 11. I get a call from our head of 26th Street some years ago, what the hell happened to the consecutive sentencing statute? I know they didn't repeal it. <laughs> Other than the prostitution recidivist that Justice Burkett talked about, uh, penalties don't go up, they don't repeal statutes, when they create duplicate offenses, which causes innumerable problems, some that Justice Burkett alluded to. When they uh, added the 15, 20, 25 uh, in the 1990s, they didn't bother to repeal the armed violence statute, which had been on the books for over 30 years, where you could almost have any felony with a gun would be uh, 15 years, but with the armed robbery in the 15-year add-on, it became 21. And Joe Burkett, I, through the State Bar Association, spoke with the governor's staff to say, you've got problems, not only in the way the bill was structured, uh, somebody must have given the Republicans acid in the 1990s because uh, for about a year and a half, they were passing all these multi-subject bills. They would include a sex offender penalty increase with a tax uh, to solve the leaking underground storage tank problems. <laughs> so with, unlike the federal system, which does not have a single subject clause restriction, uh, we had that in Illinois, and somebody ignored it for about a year and a half until the Illinois Supreme Court had to say, like, wake up down there, guys, listen to people like Joe Burkett, maybe a Republican at the time, listen to Steve Baker, uh, listen to the State Bar Association, and not have the attitude of a Governor Ryan, you know, God love him from the defense <laughs> perspective for the, the death penalty moratorium, but he was a politician first, and he ignored the admonitions of prosecutors and others to say, when you make these changes, there are unintended consequences 
that you have to think about. Because Illinois, unlike the federal constitution, has what they call a proportionate penalty clause. Uh, unlike the federal constitution, if you have two different offenses with essentially the same elements and different penalties, the one with the more severe penalty is going to be declared unconstitutional in violation of the proportionate penalty clause. So when I and others in the 1990s told Governor Ryan's staff, if you're going to do the 15, 20, 20, 5 to life, if you want to double the size of the Department of Corrections, you better think about repealing the Arm Island statute. They didn't, and we've had over 15 years of contentious litigation, and it took 15 years to solve the problem that arguably could have been solved in the late 1990s with people thinking instead of uh, how can I get an item to put on my campaign agenda, but rather what are the consequences in 5, 10, 15 years. But many elected officials don't care 5, 10, 15 year outs. They care about the next election, and particularly in the House where they run every two years, they're essentially in campaign mode forever. If they're in a safe district, they really don't have to worry about it. If they're in a 50-50 type swing district, that's the people who love this type of legislation. With regard to the uh, Sentencing Policy Advisory Council that, uh, again, Justice Burkett alluded to, it's probably taken about two and a half, three years to get off the ground. Again, it's got elected officials, victim advocates, law enforcement, the same type of scope of individuals as uh, was on the Clear Commission. And hopefully what they'll do is what the legislature should have been doing for the last 40 years, which is if you're ever going to raise a penalty, if you're ever going to create a duplicate offense, you know, we don't need mail fraud in the state of Illinois. We got theft by deception. But somebody wanted to put it in their campaign literature. And if down the road there's a disparate penalty between the two, then we're going to have more proportionate penalty litigation. So hopefully the Sentencing Policy Council will get fiscal impact notes from the Department of Corrections, from the Administrative Office of Illinois Courts, to talk about the impact in caseload, both on a local level as well as a state level, so that intelligent decisions can be made. One year, about eight, ten years ago, the leadership in the House, after they let out a committee about 20 penalty en enhancements, got fiscal impact notes from the Department of Corrections. And when they added them up, said this is impossible. We're going to have to build another penitentiary. So leadership went to the members and say, you got three penalty increases. You're going to pick one. Go to the experts. Find out where you get the best bang for the buck. If there is such a thing as deterrence, where is it best used? The SPAC group, as I mentioned, took a while to get rolling. One of the good things they did do in the state of Illinois in response to uh, gang shootings and other problems in the city of Chicago, there was a proposal that came out of the um, mayor's office essentially saying, we have to address this somehow, and the only way I know how to address it is the same way uh, if, you, if all you have is a hammer in your toolbox, er, the world's a nail. And we're going to make every felon UUW non-probationable. Well, the re reaction from the defense bar is we will litigate motions to suppress, bench trials, jury trials. If I got a first offender with no criminal history and you're telling me he's going to the penitentiary, I'll give him a show. Luckily, SPAC came in. They had looked at penalty increases over the last uh, 10 years. 90% of the penalty increases did not have a fiscal impact note. That's not a way to run a railroad. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Erica? 
So the Institute for Justice Clinic on Entrepreneurship is a teaching clinic at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, I have a cold, so if I'm not speaking loud enough, holler at me, please. Okay. Um, and we work with small businesses. We were one of the first legal clinics to provide pro bono services to for-profit businesses. Our focus is to serve low and moderate income entrepreneurs in the Chicago area who otherwise couldn't afford legal counsel. Students at the law school um, under the supervision of attorneys provide consultation on transactional legal matters that touch on the operation of small businesses. So when I first heard about the topic for this panel, I wasn't really sure uh, what that had to do with us. We don't practice criminal law. But as I thought about it more, it really occurred to me what an eye-opening experience it has been in my supervision of this practice, working with this clientele, to see the proliferation of criminal penalties in business licensing statutes that apply to even the smallest businesses here in Chicago and in Illinois. The operation of nail salons, cosmetology, beauty salons, um, barbering, uh, offering diet, diet advice, these things are not areas where you necessarily think there's going to be criminal penalties for the practice or engagement in these activities. But in fact, there are express uh, fel felony level pel penalties built into the statutes on the state level for each of those type of activities. Um, so that proliferation of penalties is one way that we've seen th this, this issue touch on small businesses. The other way is through the broad authorization of police powers to regulatory agencies to enforce business licensing provisions. Uh, that occurs again also on the state as well as the municipal level. It is something that um, Judge Bur Burkett talked about briefly about the federal level uh, existence of these regulatory penalties we focus mainly on the state and local level where those come to bear. What we don't see in the clinic is sort of wide ranging criminal prosecutions of businesses for felonious barbering. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but we do see that there, the business owners come to us usually having received some, some, some sort of notice of violation or they're starting up their business and they want to know what the legal framework is for them to operate in. And when they're informed that there are criminal penalties that could attach to these violations, uh, that creates a culture, certainly a sense of fear, a sense of the business not wanting to, not being wanted by the state or by the municipality, uh, and really concern uh, with people who have invested in many cases their livelihoods into starting a business that they could be subject to criminal penalties. The criminal penalties are in many ways just the final layer on a structure that is more civil but also difficult for the businesses to operate in, and, and I mean by that that the, uh, the laws, the licensing laws that govern the operation of the businesses can be very vague and difficult for the businesses to determine what their scope is. And, that, and when you're talking about businesses that for the most part don't have access to legal counsel, and we have a roster of approximately 20 businesses that we'll work with in a given academic year, the vast majority of nail salons and uh, you know small food businesses are not consulting with legal counsel to help guide them through this regulatory framework. They historically, if you think about mom and pop businesses, they haven't really required legal counsel to navigate the legal framework in which they are operating. But the complexity of these laws and the ambiguity that's built into them is creating a situation where it is difficult for the small businesses to operate without that guidance or where they can easily step over the line, sort of a trap for the unwary, and find themselves in violation of a business licensing provision without 
intending to do so or multiple violations. Uh, one thing that is routinely built into these provisions both on the state and on the, on the municipal level is that each day that a business operates out of compliance with the code or with the statute is another violation. And the criminal penalties that are built into these uh, provisions usually trigger off of a certain number of violations. So the first violation wouldn't necessarily trigger a criminal penalty, but multiple violations would. And so it's very easy for a business to inadvertently step over a line and find itself in a situation where it is not only potentially liable for financial uh, penalties, but also criminal penalties. Like I said, we don't necessarily see that in terms of wide-ranging prosecutions, but it's the threat behind it as the businesses um, are operating in, in these environments. It's also very easy for businesses, uh, even innocent businesses, to have reputational damage just from the allegation of a violation or the cost of trying to contest a violation, which can be difficult to do without legal counsel and, and frankly, from my experience, difficult to do even with legal counsel. Uh, the, interpret the state and local licensing laws leave a broad discretion in terms of interpretation of the requirements and um, they are not necessarily enforced equally, even throughout the city, for instance. One example of that would be that it is not possible, actually, for uh, food vendors, uh, cart vendors, like tamale vendors, to get a license in Chicago to operate legally. But in many neighborhoods, that law isn't enforced and they, they operate. You've probably seen them if you live in the city in, in different neighborhoods and without a threat of enforcement. In other neighborhoods, there's police powers that are brought to bear consistently on those vendors and tickets are issued, quasi-criminal and quasi-criminal citations for operating without a license. The food will be destroyed oftentimes, uh, bleach dumped on it, and um, it, it's not enforced consistently throughout the city, but more importantly, what we hear in our work are people raising the question of why are the police powers even being brought to bear on these particular individuals? So for instance, a tamale vendor is having his, is receiving a criminal citation and having his or her foodstuffs destroyed and there are drug dealers operating across the street and the police powers are not focused there. So that's the kind of thing that to me was a surprise coming into the clinic and seeing that this is the environment that small businesses are operating in. Um, the other aspect that we see in addition to sort of express criminal penalties that are built into the statutes are broad catch-all provisions that, and this is particularly true in the Chicago Municipal Ordinance. I, you know, had a handout and I'm vaguely following it, but w a few things that I wanted to point out because these were real eye-openers to me is that any person who fails to obey any order of the Commissioner of Chicago's Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection in connection with a business license is ultimately subject to a two to ten thousand dollar fine and up to six months imprisonment. Uh, that's just a broad catch-all built, built into the statute that doesn't even, um, that is duplicative, duplicative in some circ circumstances of the express jail provisions that are built into other licensing categories under the Chicago Code and I pointed some of those out in the handout but there are jail provisions built into the code for the unlicensed provision of doggy daycare services for, for the unlicensed activity of delivering letters by bike messenger in the loop and again a question of whether these are the types of activities where the police resources should be targeted um, when there are a lot of other concerns here in the city. The other extension is that the Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Commissioner 
and all of its investigators and employees, which it's a large department, um, are designated by Chicago, Chicago Municipal Code um, to have full police powers to enforce the business licensing provisions of the code, including the right to arrest persons underneath un for business, vi business violations. So again, that's an extremely broad grant of power uh, in a regulatory framework where you're likely to have persons who can inadvertently run afoul of these criteria. So I'll stop there, and, um, but I, there's more in the handout and hopefully more I can answer questions about. Well, that uh, dovetails nicely into what, uh, what I think about in terms of this subject matter. Um, I became a prosecutor because I, I envisioned I would be trying murder cases and dealing with violent offenders, and, and instead uh, Mr. Burkett rewarded me with the child support division. <laughs> um, where I prosecuted deadbeat dads, um, with some consolation, I got to put people in jail. And uh, I put a lot of people in jail. But uh, quoting Arnold Schwarzenegger from True Lies, they were all bad. Um, but this, this, is what, this is what we're dealing with. People want to comply with the law, and that's what Erica's talking about. If people know what the law is, they will adjust rational people will adjust their conduct to meet the law or to avoid the, the criminal sanctions. Um, the people that I thought that I wanted to go and prosecute, and I you know, did get some chance to do that, the truly violent ones, the rapists, the murderers, um, and this is where I would, I would guess I would disagree with uh, Mr. Baker. I believe in the death penalty. I believe in specific deterrence, and I wish it were still the law of the land. That having been said, that debate is gone. What are we left with? We are left with a rapidly escalating traffic situation in this state. We have innumerable ways to become suspended, and we're policing uh, traffic matters that few can believe are, are misdemeanors very aggressively, and I'm not sure that, it, that it's all warranted. Now, why, why would we concern ourselves with, with the overcriminalization of, of these kinds of behaviors? We're creating black marks on people's records that are keeping them from doing their jobs, both directly by leading to suspensions and indirectly by giving the misdemeanors that, they, that are discovered later in criminal background checks and they against a, a candidate from, from some other, maybe even another state, uh, are going to be at a disadvantage. And we're doing that to our people. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that, what I, what I mean by that in a little more detail. But, but having seen all sides of this, I was a prosecutor for 10 years. I worked, uh, I was legal counsel for the Illinois Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and I've been a, a criminal defense attorney for five years now. And you see, you just, you just kind of see a, a, a little different aspect of this every time you change job. Now, I said I started off policing child support. We did that through contempt powers. If you didn't uh, abide by your child support order, uh, you could be held in, in contempt, not criminal contempt, but indirect civil contempt, and you could be incarcerated until the debt, the debt was paid, a, a purge. So it wasn't indefinite in incarceration. It certainly wasn't prison. But there was, there was a criminal sanction created. Um, it kind of lurked out there as a threat, but it's very rarely applied. Um, it's, they're difficult cases. Uh, they're difficult to prove. It's like a, a business of financial crime. Uh, it's hard to prove intent when you're dealing with, with a paper crime or exchange of money or the lack of exchange of money. And, and who do you go after? You go after the, the very poor person who can't get a job when the construction industry is at a low and, and can't lay bricks and therefore not pay his child support. Or did you go after the, the stocks and commodity trader who, who had a very large child support order and somehow has figured out a way to, to, to make their income uh, somewhat disappear and, and their board well, It's just a difficult, it's a difficult question, is, is very seldom used, but, but, but scary in its, in its implications. Um, one of the things I frankly do a lot of, of work with now is, is speeding tickets. Um, 
people finding out that uh, they didn't realize it. They, they mailed in tickets. They were promised supervision, or so they thought, on the ticket. And lo and behold, they end up with convictions and rapidly lead themselves into a situation where they're suspended. They get a nasty gram from the Secretary of State. Well, what, what can I do about this? Then we have situations uh, in the last two to three years where aggravated speeding, uh, speeding 40 miles over the limit is a Class A misdemeanor. You cannot get supervision. Speeding 30 miles over the limit is a Class B misdemeanor. You cannot get supervision. While I made those two sentences, there were about 20 violations of that uh, misdemeanor statute on the last leg of 290 as the speed limit transitions into that 30 mile an hour zone as you approach the bridge. No one is going 30 miles an hour. I, frankly, thank God they're not. Um, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to get home. Um, so y you see these, you see these uh, come down the pike. Someone calls. I, I didn't know that. I was, I was passing through. I'm a CDL driver. I came through Indiana. I, I didn't hit the brakes fast enough in a construction zone, and now I'm facing a misdemeanor, which is almost certainly going to cost me my trucking job. You know, wh what's to be done about it? Um, wouldn't reckless driving cover this category? I mean, what, if you're operating your vehicle at an unsafe speed, and it, you know, that, that seems like it would carry, um, it would carry the day. Um, if you're truly going 100 miles an hour in a, you know, a 40 mile an hour zone, I think you got, you got some, some evidence there. But suppose it's 3 o'clock at night and you're hurrying home on 90 and there's no other traffic. You haven't, if there's no other traffic around you, you haven't actually put anybody at risk. But you've committed uh, a Class A or Class B misdemeanor, un not subject to supervision. Um, when you think about it, this is actually worse than a DUI where you'd be under the influence of alcohol, you could actually strike another vehicle, cause an accident, some forms of injuries, not severe ones, but some forms of injuries, you could get supervision, class A misdemeanor, have no problem, but speeding 40 plus, no one at risk, you, you could end up with a, you could end up a convicted misdemeanor. Um, speeding in a construction zone. We have taken uh, examples of, and I think the, the speeding 30 plus example was a, a young girl that was, was killed in a traffic accident, you know, it very, uh, you know, pulls at the heartstrings and a legislator uh, ran down and, and, and had to accelerate the, uh, the penalty provisions. Speeding in a construction zone was somewhat similar. I remember they were hot days. There were two incidents that I recall specifically. And uh, in the morning commute, uh, somebody lost, two people lost control of their vehicles, entered uh, the orange barrel areas, crashed into construction workers and killed them. But it wasn't actually the speed wasn't the total story there. Both of those crimes, as I recall, directly involved alcohol. So they were DUIs, and causing the death would have been reckless homicide, and in fact, that, that would have been a felony. So, so why did we need to do what we did with speeding in a construction zone? If you get two convictions for that offense in a year, you're suspended. Um, we're limiting, we're taking away the court supervision, where we, we increase penalties generally for traffic moving violations. There was uh, a specific incident. I, I leave the names out of these mostly because I can't remember them. But uh, uh, you could you could Google these kinds of things. A Ferrari is on a relatively uh, you know uh, street with traffic signal devices and plowed into I believe a station wagon at a high rate of speed and and uh, the driver of the Ferrari and the mother and child in the other vehicle were killed. It shocks the conscience when you check and you find that the driver of the Ferrari had 65 court supervisions for speeding. Uh, they had the money, they had a defense attorney, and they would go and just get supervision after supervision after supervision, and the Ferrari never apparently went less than, than 50 miles an hour. Um, I'm not making light of it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's somebody was killed. But the reaction from the legislature was, you get two court supervisions in a one-year period, and you get three convictions, and you're suspended. So you can see how this could, could rapidly escalate if you're not paying attention, maybe you have a car accident, maybe the next time you speed, maybe the prosecution for traffic violations has increased in a certain area. There are some counties that are known for that, and, and perhaps uh, one of my clients found out you just, you know, you're, you're just going past the same officer uh, who waits in the same place every day, and you're not paying attention, and, and, and you rack these things up. So, uh, you know, they, they, it happens, but no one's hurt. So you're, you're suspended. What happens when you're suspended, and why do you become suspended? Well, there are any number of reasons why you get suspended. You'd be amazed at the collection mechanisms that apply. Child support, you can have your driver's license suspended for child support. 
Uh, too many parking tickets. You can have your license suspended. Um, accidents that you didn't pay for. You know, you, you didn't pay for whatever. They, that's a collection mechanism. They, um, generally, money owed, owed the state for other missed violations. Um, zero tolerance. So a youngster is at a, an institute of higher learning, and uh, the police arrive, and, and, and everybody's been imbibing, and the officer reads you the zero tolerance warning, and no vehicle involved at all. Uh, you'll get a zero tolerance suspension lodged against you. The only way to challenge it is to have a full-blown Secretary of State hearing. So there, so you know, you get DWS a number of driving while license suspended a number of different ways. What happens with driving while license suspended? It's a Class A misdemeanor. I tell my clients in the three-inch thick statute books, it is the easiest thing for a prosecutor to prove. All they have to do is establish that you were driving. Any witness can do that. It doesn't have to be a cop. I saw you driving down there by the Art Institute. And then they enter the court purposes abstract, the, the, the self-authenticating document for the Secretary of State. That's the trial. How do you defend against that? You don't. So you end up pleading, negotiating, whatever. Well, they not fit uh, to leave that alone with its ease of proof. They've increased the penalties so that you are on your third offense, you're going to be threatened with jail in almost any jurisdiction in this state. Um, on your fourth, you're looking at 30 days. Um, and then for DUI-based offenses, which are dangerous offenses, and I am running low on time, um, your first driving while license suspended after a DUI suspension revocation is felony eligible, your very first one, and it rapidly escalates to where you get to 180 days uh, mandatory in imprisonment, whether that be jail or, or prison, and there is no day-for-day -day credit. And what we saw in uh, 2010 when uh, the prisons were full and, and Governor Quinn released, uh, released at mass releases, uh, the DWLS offenders that had the 180-day provision stayed, people that attacked people with knives were released. And the turnaround time, I'm, I'm kidding you not, was, was some, for some violent offenses was two weeks. You know, um, with the warden's credit and the way things applied and the, and the desire to, 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 to make sure the prison levels were appropriate, those, some of those people were, were serving two weeks and going home, whereas somebody who had been c committed driving while license suspended, not hurt anybody, okay, it's essentially a status offense, were sitting for six months solid. Um, other states don't do this, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to my end to a close. Um, in Oregon, the state of Oregon, 20 convictions in a five-year period will get you suspended. <laughs> Nevada doesn't recognize any out-of-state convictions. <laughs> God bless them, there's nobody there, so s speed all you want. Um, Indiana doesn't recognize court supervisions. If you plead guilty here and get a conviction and you're driving back and forth, you know, you, you're, you're rapidly, uh, you're rapidly escalating, escalating your risk. I don't think that this... Uh, promotes a good respect for the law. I don't think that it is informed uniformly because of IS, uh, Illinois State Police budgets. I think there are stretches of the highway, there are very few troopers. Um, they're not, even if, they even if they wanted to, they couldn't capture everybody that's, that's, that's violating these statutes. So it becomes extremely random. And it makes uh, my clients and, and, and our friends and neighbors are very angry. Well, why are you bothering me? You know, why, why do I need a defense? Why am I being threatened with jail? And that disrespect for the laws is going to have other, I think, long-term ramifications that, that I'm not sure we're comfortable with. Um, so that's my part. Um, speeding, not so bad. Murder, awful. Um, and um, I would yield the questions. Thank you. Well, thanks. Some questions from the audience. Let me just ask first. You wait until you get the microphone uh, to make it easier not only for everyone to hear, but easier for the Manhattan Institute to be able to record the event. And second, Please ask a question rather than make a speech. Does anyone have any questions at this point? The fellow right there was the first one. A question for Erica. Um, advising someone to eat more vegetables, that, that could be a felony. Do I have to receive money for the advice, or what if it's just free advice? I said, like, my grandma said to eat more vegetables, and she was right. Now, felony? <laughs> Your grandma is safe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it does need to be for compensation. Uh, but the framework in which this law could apply, uh, let me give you an example of where there can be ambiguities. If, uh, <coughs> if you're a blogger and you've recently 
started um, adhering to the paleo diet and you think this is a great diet, lots of meat, lots of vegetables, no grains, and you found that it's actually improved your health and you want to share that information with other people, you start blogging about it and you start offering to provide more detailed information about this diet, perhaps uh, in exchange for some limited compensation or a donation to your blog site, uh, you could potentially run afoul of the restrictions on the unlicensed practice of nutrition and dietetic services. I say potentially because the statute is so broad, there's certainly a, you know, a question. Uh, many people would argue that's an exercise of your free speech rights and not an unauthorized practice of a business occupation. But this is the type of situation where a regulatory agency could file a notice of violation and the business owner would be put into the position of having to try to defend themselves to prove their innocence uh, of not having violated this, this statute rather than being, being given a presumption that they're operating in good faith and the, the state or the municipality would have to prove the violation. So, so yes, eating vegetables is good and you can certainly tell one another about that, but if you start charging for it, even something that simple, you could run afoul of the provisions. Yes, please. Just to piggyback on that, I work for the Department of Professional Regulation. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 15 years, and we are a complaint-driven agency. We don't uh, initiate our own complaints, and I'm not aware of any uh, law enforcement agency doing their own investigation into unlicensed professional practices. Yeah, so that's what we've seen in the clinic is very much that the way that issues come to regulatory agencies' uh, view is through complaints. Unfortunately, what we also see is that the primary drivers of complaints are competitors within the industry. <laughs> so, it's not so much uh, consumers who have had a bad experience and, and are are, are filing complaints, but competitors who have concerns about the, the competitive environment who are filing these complaints. So I, I would agree with that, that that's a primary way that these, these issues are brought to the fore. But a competitor who has a license to bring those, who has gone to the trouble of securing their business and getting their correct uh, training or level of insurance which we require to protect the public. Is so the complaint. That's, that's often the case that a business will have a license and will be sort of on the lookout for businesses that don't have that license. The issue is that many of these laws are so broad that it can be very difficult for a business to even determine or even imagine that it might have fallen into the ballywick of the scope of that statute such that it would be required to get the license. The other issue that comes up that we see is that the the statutes are written at a particular place and time where industry practice is a certain way and then technological or other, other innovations take place that change the way people are operating their businesses but the requirements, the statutory requirements are based on an industry model that was from some time ago perhaps and doesn't take into consideration the uh, improvements or the modifications that an innovator in that area might bring into the competitive marketplace. So that's another area where I think businesses can get caught up not intentionally trying to be unlicensed scofflaw businesses operating, you know, unfairly in a realm where other businesses are licensed, but where simply their business model isn't one that fits into the regulatory framework or it wasn't one where they even imagined that they would get picked up in it. The woman over here had a question. Well, everybody says that ignorance of the law is no defense. But when you get to this very, very detailed, I mow my lawn and I've got a, a violation, of, you know, maybe a criminal violation of the EPA or something. Uh, is there uh, a perception on any of your part that a court will say, you know, 
you didn't know about this law where we're not going to enforce it criminally against you. We'll just, you know, a fine the first time, but if you violate it again, uh, that yeah. is, 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 ahead, there, yeah. is there that ability in the law? I, I can speak to this on criminal felony misdemeanor area where uh, there may be a well-intended statute that's overbroad. In the criminal context as opposed to the civil context, you have this void f for vagueness to process challenge that's occasionally made. In a couple of cases that I've seen over the years, uh, both in response to uh, car thefts and uh, uh, gang drug people using their vehicles, open title uh, even as it applied to a used car salesman. He didn't want to put in his name on the title to save the money, so he keeps the title blank. Uh, he has you sign it, and then when he sells the car, he puts in the buyer's name, and the buyer takes the title and gets the registration and a new title. That was a felony. It was enacted into law maybe you know, 12, 15 years ago as an anti-stolen car initiative. Uh, but they didn't have to prove in criminal intent. Uh, so the court, in response to the constitutional challenge, added a criminal purpose into the statute. Now, some statutes they declare outright unconstitutional. Uh, other times they'll judicially uh, engraft a criminal purpose uh, language. Uh, we saw that in addition to the open title litigation. We also saw it for uh, secret compartments in your car. If you have a car accident and you're unable to replace your airbag, that arguably is a secret compartment. <laughs> Yet there is no intent to house a gun or drugs. You just didn't have the money uh, to pay your deductible and get the car bag replaced. So in that instance, the court also added this criminal purpose into the statute. But lit litigating on a constitutional due process Every time somebody passes a statute like this, expands upon the concerns to my left when the criminal purpose should be in the statute to begin with. And when, and when you raise it at that level, they say, well, let the courts worry about it. Let, let, me, uh, let me add, um, I, I feel like Woody Allen in the, one of his movies where there are two people in front of him in line talking about Marshall McLuhan. And, <laughs> Woody Allen is able to say, I just happen to have Marshall McLuhan right here. Because um, in this instance, I can actually speak uh, to the question with regard to something that Ed Meese and I just published within the last few months. Uh, in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, we published an article called Reconsidering the Mistake of Law Defense. Historically, the mistake of law defense was unavailable in the federal system. Uh, and in fact, it's been unavailable for you know, hundreds of years. But the reason it was unavailable was that the defense was rejected eight, nine hundred years ago when there were only nine felonies. Originally, common law had only nine felonies, and every one of the felonies was matched up with the moral code. Everyone knew you were not allowed to murder, to rape, to burgle, to swindle, do things like that. So the idea that you could say, I didn't know it was a crime, uh, was kind of silly because you knew it was immoral. It was a sin against God, and therefore it was a crime against the king. That's not true anymore. The problem we have now, ironically, is at a wholesale level. As my colleague talked about the void for vagueness doctrine, that deals with statutes at the retail level. If a particular statute is indecipherable, if it just is an ink spot where it's actually supposed to have a verb or a noun or something to tell you what it is you're not allowed to do, the courts will hold it unconstitutional because it's impossible for the average person to know what is prohibited. The problem now is 
with the complexity of and the intricacy of a lot of the codes out there, statutory and regulatory, the problem has been removed from a retail level to a wholesale level because no one can know all of the laws. You don't have the moral code as a go-by. The idea that running a, a, a business, like uh, Erica said, should be no, known to everyone as being a crime is just silly. Uh, whether or not the laws are on the books, they have to be understandable to the average person. If they're uh, not understandable, because there are so many of them out there, then the average person is put in the position of having to consult with a lawyer before engaged in any sort of activity, which is an alien notion to the American criminal justice system. But available for reasonable fee at Catherine Harry and Associates. <laughs> In, in the back of the room. The last, question. last question? Okay. Thankfully, I'm on a bicycle, so whatever I've imbibed uh, earlier this evening is not going to subject me to some sort of reckless endangerment or uh, class A misdemeanor. So that's at the risk of violating the no speech con uh, uh, injunction. You know, this topic is the over-criminalization of the laws of Illinois, and at the risk of changing the topic, which of course is a common tactic of uh, defense lawyers everywhere, um, I wonder whether there is any reason to have faith in the Illinois criminal justice system as it exists. Uh, Justice Burkett has left the building, so he doesn't have to comment on the abortion that was the Hernandez Cruz uh, Buckley situation with regard to uh, Janina Carrico's brutal rape and murder. But um, since the uh, sparing of uh, Macer's Leopold and Loeb, uh, there have been few, if any, reasons to champion the Illinois criminal justice system, save perhaps for ju uh, George Ryan's can, commutation can I, can of I the sentence. Can I play the role of judge here for a minute and ask, is there a question? Yes, the question is, the question is, <laughs> Is there any reason for any citizen of Illinois, short of those who are in hock to the Democratic Party or are underwater on their mortgages, to have any faith that the criminal justice system can work for the benefit of individual citizens in this state? Go ahead. Yes, of course, you know, the... Um, the people that become police officers, the people that become prosecutors, um, they're not uh, generally doing this to, to become wealthy. Uh, prosecutors are chronically underpaid. Public defenders uh, are underpaid. Um, in terms of, you know, market rates for gra recent graduates from law school, of course, um, perhaps, you know, these are, these are bargains, obviously, you strike when you choose your field, but they're good people. Um, I haven't seen uh, much in the way of really no prosecutorial misconduct, well, save one. Well, well, I, I don't want to get this. Is not a back and forth. We are we are you know a nation of laws, but it's administered by men and and women. And generally speaking, these are very fair-minded people. Um, the Cook County prosecutors, who I you know made jokes about when I was a DuPage County prosecutor. Uh, generally a, a reasonable lot. The judges generally, um, you know, they, they try to get it right. Um, I'm not lamenting uh, the overall quality of, of, of the judicial system. And I guess, um, you know, perhaps ask how did we get here? Um, and just I'd, I'd say in closing that, you know, while no one drop believes they're responsible for the flood, you have... Um, legislators that, as, as Mr. Baker uh, talked about, um, they have a desire to make themselves look good, and, and they're unfortunately sometimes very bored in Springfield, and they come up with great ideas like increasing everything to a felony. And now President uh, Cullerton, uh, then head of the Judiciary Committee when I was legal counsel, he joked that you were only allowed, uh, members were only allowed one felony increase per session. You know, but it's really not, that's really not a joke. So, so I guess look to your legislators. Um, if, if you're worried about the over-criminalization of our laws, um, look where it's written. 
with that, I want to uh, encourage everyone to give our panel a rousing hand <laughs> for devoting their time and giving you the benefit of their thoughts. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.